I'm reminded of a quote by um, William Blake who said, um, I must create a system or else be a slave to another man's. Um, it's not always possible. It's not possible to see the system, only the results of the system. For example, here's a simple system uh, in which it might be possible to see the, uh, the results of the system, but not the system itself. Here's another example of a variation on that system in which um, you can see that one element looks as though it's either taken out of the base or it's about to be put back into the base. So there's a, the, 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 here there are two slices have been either taken out or it's implied that they're about to be put back. In a way there's an ambivalence about a work like that. You can see it in at least one of two ways, or two ways. Um, so that's the result of uh, a system. It might not be possible to describe the system itself in simple words. It might be, it might be difficult to even program the rules into a computer in order to uh, find out what all the other possibilities are. I, I don't know. A few years ago it wasn't possible to do that, but it might be possible now. I think my earliest recollections of I were my mother's sketchbook, that she did um, uh, little um, uh, pictures and, and drawings, and I used to like to look at this. And um, during the war, um, we moved away from London briefly, and I went to a school in on the Welsh borders and on the way to school it was a long walk across the fields and on the way we heard a noise of um, uh, vehicles and we saw a column of tanks and um, when I got to school the teacher said we'd, oh, we'd like you to, she'd like the children to make a freeze, a cut out freeze, so I made a cut out freeze of tanks and uh, the next day I came in it was pinned up on the wall and this was the first kind of encouragement that I'd had from this particular teacher. So I thought, she can't be that stupid. Um, and then um, later, oh, I don't know, later, uh, my parents took me to the National Gallery after the war. They, they, and I remember seeing Van Gogh's yellow chair. And they explained to me that he, he, he was a strange character. But um, there were also um, pavement artists in and around Chelsea that I, I that used to fascinate me. And I used to like to draw on the pavements as well. Um, then I got into um, more serious things when I was older. At secondary school, I wanted to learn to paint watercolours. So I got a book by A. M. Rich on how to paint watercolours, and it was all about um, the picturesque. And uh, when I lived in the suburbs of um, Catford and Dorsham, there wasn't anything you could call picturesque. So I used to cycle for miles looking for something picturesque, like a bridge over a stream or something of that kind. And on the strength of painting these watercolours of, um, watercolours of the Thames actually, I walked along the Thames near Greenwich and I painted um, uh, barges and um, sunsets. and. Um, I discovered that you could paint a sunset using earth colours like um, light red, which is an earth colour, uh, in watercolour and it gives just the right effect of sun sunrise, sunlight, sunset. So I did a few of those and uh, Goldsmith accepted me on the basis of those watercolours. And on the first day I took my watercolour kit along and my watercolour paper and they said, no, we don't do watercolours, we do poster paint because this was the time of um, this, the, the people that taught, they were probably um, at the height of their powers in the 1930s, and lots of um, posters were done for British Rail in poster colours, and uh, that's what they taught. 
and uh, when they taught composition it had to be done in poster colours, we weren't allowed to use oil paint. We didn't use oil paint until our third year, officially, at Goldsmiths. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's how, that's a bit how it started. I think that um, we probably need to um, explain a bit what, uh, what we mean by systems because everyone has their, their, their own idea and I think that um, although for us it might have positive connotations for a lot of people, it has very negative connotations because I think inbuilt in the idea of a system is the fact that it ultimately will fail. Um, the, the French um, refer to uh, sort of cheating or underhand behaviour as a système D, système D, système débrouillard, which is to get round things. And um, I mean, I, I think of the, I think of systems in a more, um, you know, perhaps in a more neutral way, uh, accepting that um, we live in a system, uh, our bodies are a system. Even the art world is a system of kinds, and uh, even a, a, a artist's movements are sometimes in some way involved with a system. I think of systems in my own work as being a, a way of communicating an intelligible idea in terms of um, shapes and colours and forms. Another word for it, another word for it might be. Um, an organisation principle that um, I predetermine and allow to run to see what the uh, what the outcome will be. Um, it doesn't guarantee that the outcome will be something that I would uh, like or accept. This one has the same property. It starts with a square, ends with a square. Like that starts with a slice, ends with a cube. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's lost its meaning. It doesn't matter. But the first in, but the first in, yeah, I suppose so. First in the series. So, um, what's missing in here is present here, and vice versa. So it's a simple counter change. What we have are um, triangles that are, that are in a progression of one third, so they grow by one third, um, and they are, they fit exactly into the square, um, and they travel round the square, and in each one, one triangle is missing. In this one, there could be another triangle, but it's missing. In this one, um, it's probably that triangle that's missing. Uh, and they go around like that, and then this one is missing, and then that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. Um, yeah, it's a simple idea like that. Um, and again, it's collage, basically. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's stuck onto the prospects. It's not, it's not painted. Do you see these works as a pair? Um, yes, I suppose so. They could... They, they do uh, complement one another. Um, I don't think they're being sold as a pair. <laughs> I don't think they're being sold as a pair. That would be a problem. <laughs> and, and also, I'm quite interested that they cast different shadows. Yeah. And uh, if you look very, very carefully, they're, they're signed along the top there so that the, the, the signature is projected onto the, uh, we noticed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in 19, um, in 1960, yep. you, are you 
just finished Goldsmiths. What, what year did you finish? Uh, I finished in 1960, and it was the year I got married. And I had a studio in um, Lewisham, Lewisham Hill. And uh, these were the first, um, first of a series of works that were based on circles. And not all of them were movable, transformable like this. And um, my friend Colin Jones and I decided to have a show at a small um, gallery in Lyle Street, which is now in the middle of Chinatown. And it was called the Artists International Association. And we worked on a joint theme of uh, positive-negative, so that uh, in this case the positive-negative was, th was the black and white. Um, we applied the theme very, very loosely. Um, and what, what was the idea of movement? What, what was interesting you there about movement? Because it's, it's, it's not appeared in your later works, at least not in, in the sense that you can actually move the pieces. No, um, at that time I was quite heavily influenced by uh, Kenneth Martin's, not only his work, but his uh, writings. And one of his main uh, concepts was um, construction through movement. And uh, he related this to uh, the work of the Cubists, for example, and uh, their methods of composition, which were based on collage, where you could take a, a whole piece of um, uh, wallpaper material and, and, and rotate it so that it gave rise to a different kind of dynamic um, uh, composition. And also, um, I later got very interested in the idea of layer upon layer, building things up layer upon layer. But, um, this was a work that theoretically had um, an infinite number of um, possibilities and that, the, that it could be uh, changed by, by the viewer. Um, so there's an element of randomness that comes into it. But since then, I've, um, I've left randomness to one side and might return to it. But uh, the layer upon layer aspect of the work occurs in all the gray reliefs in the uh, it, it, it's it's it, in, in this in this case instead of the, the layer upon layer having um, a minimal thickness like paper, I actually take the thickness of the material into account, and that forms the basic module for the work. So that that's a simple progression of one plus two plus three plus four, and then it it, it culminates in the cube. Um, so it starts with a square and uh, it's joined by a double square and then um, it's continued uh, adding uh, continually adding a square each time and uh, the, the first little group forms a rectangle two by three i thought that was rather nice and then i decided to try and extend it and the uh, the, the next uh, shape overshot it by one square and it, it wouldn't form a rectangle anymore. And I pursued this idea, and it, again, it falls short by one square at that point. And then I continued and I added another square, and it overshot by one square. And I was getting frustrated because I thought I did really want it to make a complete square if possible. And it didn't look as though it was going to. Um, and I went on and adding this is a literally square. how you did it? You this is literally how I did it, completely empirically, yeah. without any idea quite what was going you, to happen. You weren't sure if it was going to be I wasn't square. sure whether it, it would. And uh, I was surprised and delighted when I got to the eighth, uh, when I got to eight uh, squares joined together and it fitted and it completed the uh, square. And uh, after that, um, I, tended, I'd, I'd, I left it for a while until I came to London and then I talked to um, Edward Korzewski about this, and he decided that he could perhaps discover what the next possible square um, based on, uh, on these consecutive integers, which, were, which turned out to be both a triangular and a square number. After, after I played, played around with the circle, I felt there was unfinished business in, um, in the sense that uh, I wanted to look more at horizontal and vertical relationships and also to look more deeply into proportion, systems of proportion, 
um, which I did in uh, in, in uh, that work there, which is um, which is fairly fairly complicated, more more complex than the, the one that you just saw. Um, in this one, all the relationships are predetermined and measured, and uh, they're actually um, based on the root two rectangle. In fact, the whole of the the whole of the composition is organised around the root two shape, which is the A for a A paper size, which has the unique property that when you uh, fold um, an A paper shape into two halves, you get another A paper, a paper shape. So, so that's not like the golden mean? No, it's not like the golden mean. <coughs> it's constructed by taking the diagonal of a square and striking an arc and forming a rectangle in that way. And uh, it's, a, it's basically a way of simplifying. Paradoxically, it's a way of simplifying the shape. Because if you take a square and divide it into two halves, you get two double squares. Um, whereas if you divide this, as I said, um, you get um, a, another root two shape. So that it really, it's basically one shape being used here, but the different proportions and the uh, thickness of the material, again, has been taken into account. And that follows a progression of uh, root two, 1.4142. Uh, a rational number that continues. So it's an approximation to uh, root two proportion. Um, there's a lot being written and, uh, on uh, proportions, uh, especially the root two. This is going, going back to painting. Um, yes, so I mean, this, is, this is a fairly recent work. This is fairly recent, yes. This is 2000, almost 2006, I think. It's it's a 12-sided figure, dodecagon. Um, we have uh, two of the vertices joined, and a triangle is built upon them. Then we go from, we, 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 we jump to two, and we jump to one, two, three, comes to there. And then when we go from one, two, three, four, we find that the red triangle fits exactly in, in the middle. And um, it's not possible to put more triangles in. So that, in a sense, has a beginning and an end. It starts with that triangle, and then you can follow the logic through to its, its conclusion. So it's, I hope it's intelligible to anybody that, 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 that wants to know about that. And the colour is uh, white and black, was the oppositions, and, two, and a pair of complementaries, a red and a green, so that it's basically oppositions and so on. But, um, but the main idea is that it should have this um, quality of a beginning and an intelligible conclusion, an end. Um, yeah, but, but although it is a painting, it could actually equally be easily done with, with actually in, it's a collage. It could also be in a collage. Mm. And uh, I think I will have made some for a collage. It can exist as a drawing too. Um, but I wanted to see what it would look like with uh, a colour. Wanted to get your brushes out again. Mm? Wanted to get your brushes out Yes, again. I did in a way. Yes, I wanted to get my brushes. <laughs> yes. Because in fact, you, your first interest in art was, was something completely different, wasn't it? Watercolour. Yes, I was um, very much an admirer of um, Turner and um, the watercolourist Norwich School. And uh, I, um, I think basically I believed then that art was in some way based on principles. And I wondered what those principles were. And I used to get books on the principles of watercolour painting and learn from the books before I went to art school. But it was this sort of schoolboy um, belief in um, that there must be something, um, there must be something important behind the whole notion and it, it must be basic, some basic principles. And that's what I've been in pursuit of, I think. I realized that when uh, art, that this kind of art departed from uh, recognizable objects, that there was immediately a problem, a, a problem of communication. 
um, a problem of uh, knowing what the work was about, literally. So I returned to um, something very, very simple, um, a kind of uh, consistency or even um, logic, so that uh, an intelligent person could, could um, deconstruct the logic in the work and in that way uh, participate in it rather than uh, trying to relate it to something they knew about in the real world. Why, is, why are people suddenly becoming aware of it after so many decades? Mm. Um, I think that uh, during the decades of the Cold War, then uh, constructed art was associated with, uh, with what happened in the Soviet Union in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, there was no idea that uh, constructed art could could continue, um, and the other reason, uh, apart from the Cold War, um, was probably the fact that uh, abstract expressionism um, was promoted very heavily by the uh, by the museums um, in in this country. I mean, uh, abstract expressionism um, was also part of the uh, Cold War propaganda um, that it symbolized um, the, the freedom and dynamism of the uh, United States as opposed to the uh, monolithic um, uh, Stalinist um, uh, socialist realism of um, the communist blocs. Uh, so in a way, there was an underlying political climate. But then, uh, looking in more general terms, I think that um, an art which um, doesn't define itself as uh, expressionist in any way is not considered to be part of the mainstream. Um, the, it was often dismissed as being uh, described as um, cold and clinical. Cold and clinical was the word used to annihilate it. Um, so, uh, although there were interesting um, attempts like the exhibition This Is Tomorrow uh, to, uh, to show that, that it's still viable and uh, there were exhibitions, international exhibitions in uh, Zurich uh, put on by Max Bill called uh, Concrete Kunst, Concrete Art. Generally, the, the, the critics and the public were looking the other way. Um, Anthony Hill had a big retrospective at the Hayward Gallery. Um, so too did uh, the American constructivist artist uh, Charles Biederman. But again, the critics um, were looking the other way. So um, it's always, in my, in my memory, always had a negative uh, reception in this country, in the UK, which forced many of us to exhibit and sell our work in continental Europe, not, not here, because somehow there was nothing for us between uh, abstract expressionism and hunting scenes and the Royal Academy. Um, our traditions are different. It's never be, it would never be the national style. It's hard. I mean, there are many, many other reasons, but basically, I think that um, it could not. It was not marketable. I mean, even in um, in uh, Amsterdam, I took my work to a gallery, and when the owner saw it, he said, "Constructivismus, nee, thank you. Constructed art, no thanks." Um, uh, there was a resurgence of interest in, in places like at the time of uh, 1980 in Poland the unofficial galleries were able to show that, 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 that to show constructed art. Um, but it's a very, very broad generic term. It doesn't, um, it, it's very difficult to describe exactly what it is. So was that the first time that you came across the use of the word systems to describe that type of art? Probably, mm -hmm. probably, but there are many terms to describe it. Um, it's, it the generic term is abstract, but it's more than just abstract. 
constructed, uh, constructivist, um, minimal even, um, uh, formal, formalistic. Uh, one usually knows what people are talking about by the context. Also art concrete or concrete art and we toyed with the idea of using that term which had been first proposed by um, Van Duisburg, uh, Theo Van Duisburg, a Dutch architect and uh, painter and uh, um, active in, the, in Holland uh, in the 1920s until he died in 1930, 31. Um, Why did he use the phrase concrete? Ah, concrete. Well, because it was the antithesis, antonym, antithesis, antonym of the word abstract. Because prior to that, there'd been a group called Abstraction Creation, which was an international group, and um, I think Ben Nicholson and um, Barbara Edworth and uh, some uh, of the British uh, exhibited with them, but it was mostly a group dominated by the French and the Germans and some Dutch. And they published um, six copies of a, of a, of a magazine that the uh, exhibition had that they called Abstraction Creation. And after a while, I think that the idea of abstracting and abstraction from nature didn't really describe what most of them were doing. And uh, Van Duisburg came up with the idea of a new uh, movement, which was art concrete. Concrete being the, the, the opposite to abstract, abstraction. Um, concrete was really to describe um, things, actual concrete things. You know, he said that um, there's nothing more concrete than a line. Um, but abstraction from nature was, was a process of reduction, of simplification. So in a sense, most um, paintings are really abstract in that sense because they're abstracted from something, even if it's a, if it's a, a tr trees or the countryside. The artist takes some things and maybe condenses them into, um, or simplifies, you know. Um, and so it has its limits. You know, you can simplify and simplify and simplify until you end up with a dot on a piece of paper or nothing. Um, it had its upper limits. Here, each uh, group of black triangles, um, there, are, there are eight in each group, uh, they're, therefore they're forming octagons, and the black triangles are disposed so that they um, are facing either clockwise or anti-clockwise. And uh, I think there are probably uh, probably 28 here, I've never not counted them, is it one, three, four, five, six, seven, there, so there are 28 um, groups of uh, eight triangles. Uh, there are two more possibilities, which would be of a group of eight triangles all facing clockwise or a group facing anti-clockwise. Um, all the uh, all, all reflections um, and uh, positive, negative have been removed. So that here are the 28 um, most fundamental uh, types that are possible. There, there, there should be no more, no, no less. So there's also an idea of uh, of completeness, of having all of the the possibilities. Not one is given preference over another. They're all on an equal. Um, they all have equal importance or unimportance. So this is a variant on the work that I showed earlier, where there are twenty-eight um, variations on on an octagon with. Uh, eight triangles facing either clockwise or counterclockwise. If they're um, facing counterclockwise, they're black. If they're fight facing uh, clockwise, they're white. And uh, these are the main 
possibilities for that apart from completely uh, black or completely white. People who look at um, um, art systems, art, yeah. might criticise it by saying that it's, if it's based on rules, then that seems to be against the concept of creativity. If I create a rule, if I create a program yeah. on a computer yeah. and I just run it a thousand times, yeah. or, or run it with different permutations, yeah. then um, you know, yes, you'll come up with different products, but but is that um, being creative? So, what would your answer be to that point? Well, first of all, I think rules. I think they come in various categories, but I think the main category of, of, of rules is that you can have um, invented rules, and you can have um, rules that govern convention or you can have discovered rules that occur perhaps in nature, in the way that things are, in the way that things behave. And uh, some of them, myself and perhaps some of my, my colleagues would um, start with um, a simple rule, like um, a line must not, can go anywhere, but it mustn't cross itself, for example, that's a simple rule. And uh, one can go from uh, a doodle, like a line on a piece of paper, and continually um, imposing rules on what that line is allowed to do. And in, in that way, it's possible to, um, to invent or create something that didn't exist before. I mean, creati creativity suggests something rather grandiose, um, but it might be just a very, very small discovery, not something particularly wonderful. Do you generate rules to work by, or do you discover rules? I suppose I have my own innate preferences and uh, limitations and constraints. It's in my nature, perhaps it's in everyone's nature, to have uh, certain predilections for certain colours, certain shapes. Um, and I, I suppose I have to work within my own limitations, although I try to extend them. Um, various ways people have used to um, extend their, their, their own limitations, strangely enough, through using systems or through using chance and systems or chance and order um, in order to break out of their habitual way of doing things. Okay, so um, this is a this is a, a, a recent work, but it was something that um, I started when I was in my last year at Goldsmiths. Uh, it was originally a, a, an idea about collage, which is um, cut paper, cut colour paper. And the, 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 the original was much smaller and consisted of um, circles which were cut by a sharp point and uh, rotated. So I think there's a five or ten degree rotation of a circle within another circle. And it was very influenced by um, Mary and Kenneth Martin and their, um, uh, their teaching and their ideas about, about movement and moving format. Um, the the moving format is something that uh, you find in Cubism. When the Cubists started to use collage, they were able to come up with a different kind of approach to composition, which meant the, 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 the pivoting of whole areas um, of a piece of newsprint or a piece of paper, so that instead of uh, painting brush stroke after brush stroke on brush stroke, they could take a whole section of a composition and twist and uh, move it and take it through movements. And I think when the idea that you could use a moving format with 
completely abstract forms and not have violins and pipes and paraphernalia of cubism that really excited me, that idea. And Mary Martin talked about Paul Clay and she talked about rhythm. Uh, she talked about the simplest possible rhythm being one plus one, one single recurrence. And I was very excited that there could be a simplest possible rhythm. Uh, she talked about the simplest possible grid, which was four squares. And again, uh, to touch upon something as fundamental as that seemed an exciting idea at the time. Um, but uh, this is a, 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 a play on rhythm where you have um, green followed by white, followed by purple, followed by red. And then it starts to repeat green, white, purple, red, green, white, purple, red, green, white, purple, red. And then those areas, those rhythmic areas have simply been uh, rotated a number of degrees. Um, and of course there are infinite variations on that. Uh, so that was a return from monochrome, uh, achromatic colour to chromatic colour. But again, it's very simple colour. Um, white plus three chromatic colours. It's possible, I think, in this one that the, that the green and the red were intended to be opposites. In a way, this work was the forerunner of the grey reliefs that um, started in 1974. But this work dates from 1971, and it's made entirely of um, black uh, polished perspex. It's very hard to, uh, to see it because of the reflections, and it's, I think of it as a mirror. Um, the mirror seems to absorb the uh, three-dimensionality of the projecting forms and softens them. Um, it's very obvious what's going on here. There's, there's one 
square here, where the thickness of the square is um, uh, a quarter of the, uh, the length of the side, so that um, I've built layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. And that seems to be something I've often done. Maybe it's to do with my, my sort of early experiments with um, collage, where one takes a piece of material and places it on top of another piece of material, glues it on, so it's stuck from collage. Coller means to stick in French, so it's about sticking things layer upon layer upon something else. So in a way, this work's evolved from, from painting rather than from sculpture, and it's constructed in the sense that it's not carved or cast. So we're talking about a process here of uh, making, and uh, the, the way that artists make their work often influences the kind of um, arrangements and compositions that are possible. What I've said about the black mirror relief um, is true of some aspects of this grey relief. Um, I got rid of the uh, shiny surface, the shiny black mirror surface, because it was very hard to see the form. Um, it's painted grey so that it shows up on a white wall, because works are usually shown on a white wall. Um, if I'd have painted it black, then the forms again would have been maybe too softened. Um, I prefer it to be grey because it's midway between black and white and the contrast with the wall. So that, um, but, but here, I, I like to think of these as volume and void. These are the voids, these are the volumes. Um, the, the thickness of the material is quite important because that forms the basic module for the whole thing. So each part is related to the other part and to the whole by virtue of it being based on this, um, this 12 millimeter module of the thickness of this standard material. Um, it's quite obvious that that is moved out from there, that these layers are taken out of there, those layers are taken out of there, those layers are taken out of there. So it starts one, two, three, four, and the four is the cube. So nothing happens here. It just goes through a left to right oscillation. And you can look at it in different ways. I mean, you can look at it like that. You can look at it um, in, 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 in terms of the shadow and, uh, and so forth. We've got uh, here a six by six um, a grid on which is arranged uh, these various rectangles. To me, it's obviously a spiral going from the center outwards like that. And the spiral increases by one uh, unit, which is the size of the central square. And the idea is that um, something gradually accelerates and travels around and becomes a complete square. We discovered, um, that's Eddie Gorbzewski and I, that um, these are square and triangular numbers. So, there's, so that it, it's not, they're not square or triangular, they're square, they're square and triangular numbers. So that 36 is a triangular number and it's also a square number. And it's like six by six is six, six is a 36. Um, this also um, relies on the fact that um, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8 adds up to 36. So you get consecutive integers which are adding up to um, a square triangular number. And uh, that's what gives this work its form. And it's probably why I'm so interested in it, because it's quite concise. It, uh, one can follow the logic, the simple logic through and understand why things are 
as they appear in this work. There's nothing arbitrary or, or is not related to taste. It's almost, um, it's almost a kind of product of inevitableness of um, a series of numbers. Yeah, here's a work uh, that's also based on a spiral, and it's by one of my uh, mentors, uh, Mary Martin. Uh, she made this work in 1954, and that was the year that I first started as a student at Goldsmiths College in London. And um, four years later, about 1960, uh, Mary came and gave a talk on uh, art, um, on mathematics and construction. Um, it was a short two-day course, but it had a great deal of impact on me. Um, Mary, uh, like me, trained as a painter, so um, I think you could see the, the, the uh, influence of painting rather than sculpture in this work, but it started from uh, considerations about collage. And the Martins were very interested in um, the work of uh, a cubist, especially uh, Joan Gris or Juan Gris. And um, I think I picked up some of that, uh, this idea of layer upon layer from what the Martins said to me about cubism, their analysis of cubism, and the idea of a moving format was very, very important. Um, uh, I mean, the cubists would use a more moving format always tied to something figurative, like a still life. Um, whereas it dawned on me that you could use the moving format without any reference to still life or um, guitars or bunches of grapes. You could just use simple geometric forms and, um, and pivot them and, uh, and so forth. Um, so this, I think this work is called Spiral Form. I think let the work speak for himself if possible.